Heavenly Father, we thank you very much. We thank you because we know you brought us together to bless every one of us. We pray, Lord, that what we hear will prepare us for a good, great, glorious future in Jesus' name. We pray that every boy, every girl will get the very best out of your word today. And your word will enrich every life in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, we will climb the ladder of success. Through what we hear, through what we learn, and through what we practice, Lord, your promises will be yes and amen in our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, Thank you very much. We're looking at Genesis chapter 37. I'm looking at the first two verses there. Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 and 2. Genesis 37, verses 1 and 2. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was of the sons of Bilhah, and of the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father the evil report. In those verses I read to you, just two verses, we come across a father and a son, and the other children. The other children are not mentioned by name, but their mothers are mentioned. We have the name of Jacob, that's the father. And then we have the name of Joseph. Actually, we're studying about Joseph. And for some lessons in front of us, we'll be dealing with this uh, Joseph because he lived a good life, a great life, a gracious life, a glorious life. A life that we would like to emulate, would like to follow, would like to copy. A life that's challenging. A life that is inspiring. A life that was influential. It's like a tree growing up. And you have that tree with a lot of branches and green leaves as well as fruits. And everybody likes that kind of tree. But you want to understand, before a tree will be that tall and strong and fruitful, it will have deep roots in the ground. The two things I want you to have in mind, one, the roots, two, the fruits. When you have roots, then eventually you'll be able to have fruits. But before you can have the fruit, the roots will come first. And we'll be compared in scripture to trees. And that means then your roots must go deep into the ground. And then eventually we'll be able to see the fruits of your life. The believer has been compared to a house. And if that house is going to be solid, going to be firm, and going to withstand the weather and everything you have on earth, that house must have a good foundation. And we're thinking about uh, Joseph, and we're thinking what made him so successful? Because he had some real, real foundation in his life. We're looking at today the message, the foundations of a great future. Turn your Bible to Psalm 11. In Psalm 11, I'm looking at verse 3. So you'll see the importance of foundation. In Psalm 11, verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? That means then, in your own life, if you do not have foundation, what can you do in life? What can you achieve in life? Foundations are very important. As we look at Joseph, a 17-year-old boy at that time, a teenager, he was with his father in Canaan. Actually, that was not their place of origin. There were strangers there. Even then, he started laying the foundation in his personal life and conduct. If I were to tell you today, very sim in very simple terms, foundation. What foundation do you expect in your life? Write this down. Number one, salvation. 
salvation. When you look at the foundation of a house, you'll find that there are some specific places underneath in that house where you have some blocks. And the first block of foundation in your life is salvation. Number two, schooling. That's learning. And you can tell from the life of this, Joseph, he had gone through some learning. He was receptive to teaching. And what his father had taught him, he had accepted. So you have foundation number two, schooling. Number three, separation. You will find that this uh, Joseph, he separated himself from all the evil that the brothers, the senior brothers were perpetrating. He was not going to join them. He was not going to copy them. He was not going to follow after their bad behavior. Separation. Number four, service. As you lay the foundation in your life, you bring up yourself to love service, to appreciate service, and to know that whatever you are going to get in life, you serve others. I want you to tell me, and when you wake up in the morning, you put on some clothes. The people who made those clothes, they have been serving you. And then you put some food on the table and you begin to eat. The people that prepare the food, they were serving you. And then you jump into the bus and then you are going to school. The people that made or manufactured that bus, they, were served, they have been serving you. Then you come to the class and there you are. There's a building there and there's a desk where you're sitting. Those people that built uh, the school building and all those desks who are sitting on, they served you. And then there's a teacher that comes, and he doesn't come alone, he has maybe chalk in his hand. There were some people that made that chalk, manufactured that chalk, that chalk, that means they were serving. And then he comes and he opens the textbook. Somebody must have printed that textbook. They were serving you. And then you come out of class. And there's an evening class somewhere. You're doing some studies. Those people are serving you. You want to sleep at night if you're sleeping on the ground. That's concrete on the ground. Somebody did it. Service. If you're sleeping on the bed, somebody did that. That service. Life is full of service. And everybody else is serving you. That's why you too should serve. Foundation number four, service. Number five, self-control. You will find in the life of Joseph that he had self-control. Actually, that foundation of self-control, self-restraint, is so very important that young people cannot succeed in life without that foundation of self-control. Number six, steadfastness. Uh, can't you see this uh, young boy at 17? Then when he was sold into Egypt, and when he worked in Potiphar's house, he kept on, on the same principle of righteousness that he had known. Steadfastness, number seven, sanctification. He lived a holy life, a righteous life, a pure life, a godly life. He had sanctification. Let me review, go back to number one. What's number one in the foundation? Salvation. Number two, schooling. Number three, Separation, number four. Service, number five. Self-control, number six. Steadfastness, number seven. Sanctification. All that you'll find in the life of Joseph. He laid a good foundation. And as we read this title that we're looking at today, Foundations, plural. That's why I gave you those seven things. Foundations of a great future. If anybody is going to have a great future, here is the foundation that he has to lay. As I come to the study itself, I divide the study to three parts. Number one, passion for productivity. Everybody say that. Number two, partnership for progress. Can we say that? And then number three, pro uh, prospect for prosperity, everybody. Now we come to number one, passion for productivity. And when we say passion, what does that mean? You see somebody, and they say, that fellow, he has passion. He has fire. He has zeal. He has interest. He has enthusiasm. He has desire. That's passion. You know, the people do, that do not have passion, they are passive. They're so, so boys, so, so girls. They don't know how to wake up in the morning. They don't know how to get interested in anything except talking, except football. But when you have passion, 
passion for study, passion for Christian living, passion, enthusiasm for soul winning, passion. And there is something within you that is moving you. You are pursuing something. You are interested in something. You are zealous about something. There is fire burning within. There is passion. And when you see somebody doing something, if he has passion, you will know. Because his energy is there. His heart is there. His mind is there. He does everything he does with passion. And that's Joseph. Anything that Joseph did, he didn't do with lazy attitude, indolent attitude. I don't know whether I'll be able to go to school today about washing your clothes. Well, they are soaked in the water, but I don't feel like... You know those people every time, I don't feel like, I don't feel like, they don't feel like doing something good. But when people have passion, they have enthusiasm, they have interest, they have zeal, they have fire, they have something that is going on in their heart, stirring them up. That's point number one, passion for productivity. Look at that verse 2 again. In Genesis chapter 37, I'm looking at verse 2. These are the generations of, jo of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad, that's this young boy, this boy, the lad was with the sons of, Z of, of Bilhah, and was with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. At 17 years of age, Joseph was an interested, active, young man, a boy. But he was interested in service. He was active in service. He was seriously involved in the family business. He didn't say, well, that, that's, that's, that is a work. That's his cup of tea. If he does it well, that's him. If he doesn't do it well, he will reap uh, whatever benefit he wants to reap. Not Joseph. Joseph got involved with the family business, with what the father was doing. I read some time ago about a family. The father, a doctor. And all the children, doctors. Those children, like Joseph. I read of another one, the father, a lawyer. And then the children, one of the children, a lawyer. I read of another one, the father, an engineer. And then I see that one of the sons, an engineer. I was talking to a particular uh, father, and I said, oh, it's my boy. I mean, he's a son, because I had known that boy. And I said, what class is uh, that boy now? And he says, he's now almost in the final year at the university. I said, what's he reading? He gave me the profession. I said, just like you. And the father smiled. What a good thing. When the father is doing well, and the mother is doing well, and the children, they say, I want to be like my daddy. And I even want to be, go beyond my daddy. Here is Joseph. He was involved in the work of the family. And I want to encourage you that you make sure you do something. If uh, your father wants to be an educationist or a professional person, if you cannot go beyond your father, at least reach the place that your father has reached. What are we told? That he was feeding the flock with his brethren. He worked hard and he distinguished himself. And not only that, he was a person that was committed. He was committed to the service that he was involved in. That brings me back again to this, uh, to the foundation. He had at the middle of the foundations that he lay. You remember seven of them. Three on this side, three on that other side, making six. The one in the middle, what is that? Tell me out loud. Service. And that's what you'll find in the life of this Joseph. And that's what the Lord wants to find in you. Can I point to all the people in the Bible when they were very young that they followed such a step that they were involved in the father's business? Oh yes, in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm reading there from verse 11. 
And Samuel said unto Jesse, I hear all thy children. And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep, and he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. All the people that the Lord called into service and made great, they were people that were passionate for productivity. They were zealous for doing something. And service was one of the foundations in their lives. Uh, you remember Daniel? Look at it. Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1, he was one of those people that had received scholarship in Babylon. But he was very, very hard working. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, here we read, and, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the priests of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Then we're told in verse 17, as for these four children, God gave them knowledge, skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Jump down to verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in all his realm. Now, as we develop ourselves and we want to work hard, working hard, what do we work hard on? Number one, you work on your relationship with God. That is to become passionate and serious, interested in your relationship with God. That's a spiritual life. That's why the foundation actually starts with salvation. Number two, you work on your relationship in the family. Your dad, your mom, your brothers, your sisters, other relatives too. Number three, you work on your relationship with your friends. And it needs working upon so that you're not always moody, angry, bitter, sad, unhappy, and every time your friends are, they are always having to ask questions. What's happening today? You appear sorrowful. Has somebody offended you again? And you are touchy today. Looks like uh, anything we do today uh, offends you. What's the matter? Work on your attitude towards your friends so that you'll be a good person that they would like to come around. And then, number four, you work on your plans for the future, your academic pursuit. But there are two words that you need to have in mind. You work harder and you work smarter. And there are some people that work hard, but they don't work smart. They are hard working, but they are not smart. I've been asking myself, how does somebody work hard? And I've been finding out, how does somebody work smart? Before I tell you that, go to Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. And I'm reading to you there from verse 29. Proverbs 22, 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. I see one word there, diligent. Ah, so it means working hard means that I have to be diligent in the work I am doing. Chapter 21, verse 5. In chapter 21, verse 5, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness. But everyone that is hasty only to want. I see two words there. And I see that I still need to be diligent. And then there's another word. The thoughts of a diligent person. Of the diligent. Thinking. Thinking. And you know there are some people. 
they work without thinking. They don't use their brain. They don't use their mind. They don't use their heart. And they may be working and working and working hard. But boys and girls, we need to use our brain while we are working hard. Then I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23. Proverbs 14, verse 23. In all labor, there is profit. But the talk of the leaves tendeth only to penury. I'm sure you know some students in school. They are like clowns. They make everybody laugh. Anytime the teacher is not there, they come in front of the class, and their job is to make everybody relax, laugh, and they tell some funny, funny jokes. And you look at their result at the, at the end of the term or semester or at the end of the session, and they're always at the bottom of the class. And unfortunately, when they get that result, all they can do is laugh and joke. And they say, oh, things are going to be better next session, next year. Just watch me. And you'll find things are going to be better. Their friends, the talk of leaves only tend to failure and defeat and penury and poverty. But in all labor, there is profit. You work, you labor. Let me now come back to that, those words we left behind. Work hard. Can you spell that word hard for me? Hard. See how you are spare as if you have gone to sleep. Talk to me and talk aloud. Ah, each heart, head, hands. If you're going to work hard, bring your heart into it. With all your heart and with your thought. Be intelligent about it so that your heart is involved. And you know, they say that man, his heart is in what he does. And then your head, bring your head into that work. And your hands, use your hands. If you're going to work hard, it starts with the heart, the head, the hands. In their attitude, affection, action. When you're working hard, you have a good attitude to work. You wouldn't say, I don't like the subjects. You have a good attitude and good affection. And then action. You push yourself into doing something. You are active. You are dutiful. You are responsible. Attitude, affection, action are reading, reasoning, resting. When you are working hard, you have to read. You, you will read about, uh, let's say, for example, you are studying a subject. You will take some books that have questions and answers and solutions of the past uh, of the past exams and you read then you reason you use your you use your senses and as you reason then it's not just everyday work every minute work every moment work there's resting and then give their determination discipline diligence so if we're working hard our hearts must go into the work our head must be involved in that work our hands must be active in that work. And then good attitude, great affection, and godly action. Then reading, reasoning, resting. Then determination, discipline, diligence. Now, it says work smart. I'd like to hear your voice. Can you spell that word smart for me? Thank you very much. You know, whenever you are working, if you are working smart, you have a destination, you have an aim, you have a dream, you have a desire, you have a goal. You know, you are in the final class, for example, in the secondary school, and um, as you are in the final class, why don't you have a goal? Why don't you say, in this subject, in this subject, in that subject, here is my goal. Then you'll be able to walk towards it. If you don't have a goal, it will be like a person that jumped into the car and then is driving around and then the policeman stops and says, where are you going? And he says, I'm going nowhere. Why are you driving around? I'm just driving around. 
you're consuming fuel and you're wasting a lot of money on the petrol, the gas that is inside that vehicle and you're going nowhere. And when your life is like that, there is no goal, there's no destination, there's no aim, there's no dream, there's no desire. It means that you're just running around, meandering around without any goal. If you're going to walk smart, have a goal. As specific. Be very specific as to what you want. Why am I going to school? Be specific. Why am I taking this course? Be specific. Why am I trying to do my homework? Be specific. And what am I trying to do? Let there be a timetable. It is that timetable that makes you specific. You are not smart except you are specific in the work you are doing. Am measurable. That is the work you are doing. You should be able to measure. I have learned this. I have not learned this. I have gone this far. It remains this much measurable. Number three, is there attainable? That is the goal you set for yourself. You're specific, it's measurable, and it is attainable. You're not going to say, well, I want to make this, this, this in one year. What it takes for years to study. You'll make sure it is attainable Are realistic. Be very realistic as you are working. Don't, you know, there's um, young people, they're, they're studying. And while they're studying, they're dozing. And they, while they're dozing, the whole, um, they put their head on their paper, that is on their textbook. And the whole thing is already wet with their sweat. And, you know, we come to and say, what are you doing? Ah, I'm reading. But you've been sleeping for the last one hour. You are tired. And since you are tired, be very realistic. Go and sleep and then come back to eat again. That's why we say reading, reasoning, resting. And then tea there is tangible. Tangible. Uh, when you are working smart, you have done something and your achievement in that work is tangible. Give it to me. S. I'm hearing you. S. M. A R T I go to point number two now. Partnership for progress. When we talk about a partnership, look at this now. In Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. I'm reading from verse 2. We're still reading about Joseph. And we're looking at the way he did the work that he did. They, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock. What's the next word? What's the next word? With his brethren. The word with there joined him together with others. That's partnership. See, when we're working, you need to have some partners that you are working with. Now, in your Christian life, do you have partners? A boy to a boy, a girl to a girl. What kind of partners do we need? Number one, prayer partners. You know there are times you want to pray, but you are kind of lazy. You are almost sleeping. But if there were two of you, a brother to a brother, a sister to a sister, and you are in partnership together, you'll be able to pray together. And if two of you shall agree as touching anything that they shall ask of the Heavenly Father, he'll do it unto them. Number two, reading partner. Now, you're having the same subject with that other sister. And you're a sister yourself, and you come into partnership with that other sister, a reading partner partner. Number three, a study partner. We are preparing for the same jam exam or we are preparing for the same final exam. The subjects I'm taking are the subjects he's taking and we are study partners. We're studying together. The areas I'm strong, I'm able to help him and the areas I'm weak, he is able to help me. Number four, evangelism, soul winning partners. We are winning souls together. You know, there are times when you just feel, I don't think I want to talk to anybody today. 
I don't think I want to go out in evangelism today, but your brother, you are a brother, or your sister, and you are a sister, comes along. And he says, let's go out. The Lord is laying it on my heart today. We need to go out and evangelize. Partners in progress. Partnership for progress. Number one, prayer partners. Number two, reading partners. Number three, study partners. Number four, evangelism or soul winning partners. Although Joseph was a gifted boy, yet he did not do all things alone. Like Joseph, you too must learn to work with others. Whatever your gifts are, whatever your talents are, whatever your abilities are, this you can do without compromising your conviction. You will see here in the case of Joseph that he was able to work with others and yet without compromising his conviction. Let me come back again to the foundation that we spoke about. The foundation, salvation, schooling was number three separation he still kept to his conviction that we are in partnership reading partner with another person doesn't mean that every foolish thing he does i must copy him every lie he wants to tell if he wants to backslide it means i must follow him no you still keep your conviction you are a boy of conviction and you are a girl of conviction, brother, sister of conviction, because of that foundation of separation that is still in your life. Partnership is necessary, but partnership does not lead to compromise. Our schools and communities are populated with believers and unbelievers, saints and sinners, righteous people and unrighteous people. When we go to school then, although we read with others, we study with others, we work with others, and we use library books with other people, and we share our textbooks with other people, and we copy notes from other people, all the same. Number one, you take these precautions. Number one, mind your own business. If tales are going around in the school, mind your own business. If they are plotting or ganging up against the teacher, mind your own business. If they are gossiping about uh, the teacher teaching us English, mind your own business. And if they say, have you heard? Are you going to take part? Will you do this? Oh, I'm sorry. That's not what I came for. I came to school to learn. And I want to concentrate on what I came for. Number two, be friendly with your classmates and teachers. That we're Christians doesn't mean that we hate people. In fact, we love people, believers and unbelievers, and church members and non-church members. There is a level of love and friendship we manifest towards everybody that they know. They say, that uh, young lady, she's friendly, she's nice. She doesn't go about with a gloomy, long face as if, uh, you know, everybody is as offended her. Cheerful, happy, joyful, glad. Be friendly with your classmates and teachers. Number three, do your homework and work within the syllabus. Uh, you know, there are some people that have not finished uh, studying what they are supposed to study, and they're studying other things outside the uh, territory of their assignment work within your syllabus don't be distracted to all the things you, you know some young people they leave their textbooks where they are and they, they go to the cyber cafe and they're watching this and blocking this and writing this and typing this and plucking this one out and putting this one in and they're interested in things that will ruin their lives but you work hard on the essential things and then do not let people steal your books. I know some nice, nice girls. When they go to school with bag full of books, they come back home almost with an empty bag. What happened to your bag? They have stolen my books. Keep your books. There are some boys, intelligent boys. But they leave their bag where they don't ought not to leave their bag. And they are running about. By the time they come back, all the books are gone.
Be very, very watchful. And do not allow other children to steal those books. Gird your resources very well. We're talking about partnership. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I'm reading verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Have you opened it? I can't hear you. Uh -huh. Two are better than one. That's why we are partners to read, to study, to pray, to evangelize, to win souls. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And then in Proverbs chapter 27, Proverbs chapter 27, I'm reading from verse 17 there. 27, 17. Iron sharpness iron. What that means is, you know, sometimes one iron is blunt, and then the other iron will file it up and sharpen it. And sometimes you are feeling lazy. You're feeling, uh, I don't want to do anything. I'm not interested in anything today. And then your partner, your friend, will encourage you and stir you up and tell you some good, good words, inspiring words. We can do it. Let's, let's put in some minutes. Just about one hour. Let's do this before we go to play or before we go to rest. Let's do something. Iron, sharpness, iron. So a man sharpness the countenance of his friend. And then we're told in First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 12. This is good. Look at this. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. It's saying that none of us can feel self-sufficient. I can go all the way by myself. I can do everything by myself. I don't need any help. I don't need any friend. I don't need any partner. I can do everything by myself. No, you cannot. In verse 21, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. You need your brother. You need your sister. And we're told in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Here we're reading the case of Peter. He actually was by the seaside. He had labored all the night, but he caught nothing. Until Jesus came to him. And then Jesus blessed him in a miraculous way. Chapter 5, verse 4. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this Done. Uh -uh. He was the only one speaking in verse 5. I will let down the net. And then in verse 6, when they, as he was going to do it, he called his partners. When they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. Underline that word, help. That's what partners do. As partners, we help one another to move forward, to climb up, to make progress. That's why we're referred to as partners in progress. And then it says, and when they came and filled, and they came and filled the ships, so that they began to sink. And you will see then the necessity of being in partnership with other people. When you go to school and you happen to be born again, if it's a new school, immediately you get there, you will look for other believers like yourself so that you'll not be a lone ranger. And you ask somebody, she's been in the school now for about four weeks. I will say, have you discovered any other believer? No, I've, I didn't even check up. I just get to the class and I read my books and then I come out, I come back home, I've not spotted out, I've not identified any other person. Open your eyes and identify somebody like yourself, of like precious faith. 
and a serious sister like yourself, a serious brother like yourself, then you can be partners together in progress. Point number three. What's point number three? Say it loud. Thank you very much. Prospect for prosperity. And remember, all that we're talking now, all that we're teaching today, actually contributes into the foundation. In Genesis chapter 37 again, Genesis chapter 37, and I'm reading from verse 2. It says, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the land was with the sons of Bilhah. And with the sons of Zilpah, and his father, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. And you see, although he was walking with them, he was not blindfolded by their talent, ability, hard work, or fellowship, or interaction. You know, there are some people. Because uh, some others are friendly, the friendship blindfolds them. And they do, not, they do not see the things that are wrong in the life of, in lives of other people. And they'll just follow sheepishly, but not Joseph. If we are going to prosper, if we are going to make progress, here is what is necessary. You open your eyes and you see, if those people are doing some bad, bad things, you will not get involved in their bad practices. He was different because he was godly. They were ungodly. And he stood fearlessly for the truth. That's why he came back home. And then he reported the bad deeds, the evil deeds of his brothers. And like he did, so we have to do. Remember once again, part of the foundation is separation. You separate yourself from everything that is evil. In Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23. I am reading from verse 2. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. I want you to, while you're listening to me, think through now, what are the evil things that other students in your class and in your school that you get involved in? Write them down. What are the evil practices that you remember now? Yes, I remember. Last year in our class, I remember an evil practice that came up. And thank God, God gave me victory over that bad practice. Or maybe after you came back from school, in your community where you are living, some other young people like yourself, you remember the bad, bad things others are doing, bad practices. How have you reacted against those things? Or have you just, are you like dead fish? Look up here. What's the difference between dead fish and a fish that is still alive? A, a fish that is still alive will be able to swim against the tide. A dead fish will just float where the current of the river is going. That's where a dead fish will go. Are you like a dead fish? No life in you. No vitality in you. No resistance in you. And you just flow along with whatever the others are doing. That, that's not like Joseph. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest, to twist, to distort judgment. Then we're told in Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Reading there from verse 10. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 10. In Proverbs chapter 1 verse 10, my son, if sinners entice thee, tell me the rest, consent thou not. Uh, you know sinners, they entice in different ways. They may want to entice you with a gift, consent thou not. They may try to entice you with a promise, if you accept to do this bad thing with me, then I will give you this. Consent thou not. 
They may even try to lure you, entice you with a threat. Now, you're proving stubborn. You're proving holy. You're proving righteous. Ah, deeper, deeper. I know where you are going. We say, come and do this thing with us. And you will not do it with us. Now, if you don't cooperate and do this with us, then they threaten you. We will do this. Whatever method, whether they're trying to give a gift, or they're trying to deceive you, or they're trying to befriend, or they're trying to threaten, consent thou not. God will give you the wisdom and the strength and the conviction. In Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 4, reading from verse 14, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Proverbs again, chapter 14, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man, when thou perceivest not in him the leaves of knowledge. When you find a man trying to entice you, trying to deceive you, or trying to threaten you, and he wants you to do something bad, or you find a lady, you find a man, a woman, anybody, trying to make you do something wrong, go from the presence of that foolish man or foolish woman who does not know the way of God, when thou perceivest not in him the leaves of knowledge. Chapter 17, verse 15. 17, 15. He that justifies the wicked, and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. And you know, there are some people, uh, they will praise the bad people. They will congratulate the bad people. They will try to lift up, glorify, honor the bad people. That's abomination before the Lord. And others will belittle. They will abuse. So they will look down on the people that are really doing well, the good, good people. Again, that is abomination before the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 24. Proverbs 24, 24. He that says unto the wicked, thou art righteous, him shall the people curse. Nations shall abhor him. But to them that rebuke him shall be the light and a good blessing shall come upon them. Now, as we round up, you will see what Joseph did. Joseph brought their evil reports before the father. Let me read to you in Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Two. He that walketh uprightly, and walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. That is, the people that have conviction and they say, here is where I stand and I will not do evil. By the way, why did Joseph bring the evil report of those his uh, senior brothers to the father? Number one, to correct. Number two, to counsel. Number three, to convert. Number one, so that the father will be able to know what these children were doing. And then the father will be able to correct them. Joseph was younger than they were. And because of that, he couldn't correct them. And if he tried to correct them, they said, shut up. How old are you? Are we not older than you are? Because he knew he couldn't correct them. That's why he reported to the father. Number one, for correction. Number two, for counseling. So that the father will be able to see them down and say, young people, what you're doing will destroy you. It will destroy your future. 
let me counsel you. Here is the way to go. Here is the way to go. Here is what to do. Number three, for conversion. So that these young people, they'll come under conviction, they will repent, and then they'll pray to the Lord. Their lives will be turned around. They'll be converted for correction, for counseling, for conversion. We have studied today about these foundations, and these are the foundations for a great future. I pray you'll have a great future. I said you'll have a great future. But this is the time to lay the foundation. If you are not born again, you have not started laying the foundation because the very first pillar in that foundation is salvation. Then your schooling, you get serious with your schooling. Separation from evil, service, self-control, steadfastness, and sanctification. I pray that the Lord will help you to lay a good foundation now that you are young so that by the grace of God in the future, you'll be great. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. You open your mouth and you take those things one by one and then you pray. Are you saved? Have you repented of your sin? Do you have assurance that you are really saved? We're not meditating, we're praying. That means we're talking aloud to God. Let me hear you. You must pray. You talk aloud to God. Your schooling. How serious are you in the school? Do you leave home and then instead of getting to school, you branch another place? Why don't you repent today? Number three, separation. Are you separated from evil? Service. Do you serve? Do you serve at home? Do you serve in the school? Do you serve in the fellowship? Do you serve in the church? Do you serve in the society? Self-control. Do you control yourself? Or is it that every bad thing that occurs to your mind, you just let go and just do evil things? Is that self-control in your life? Steadfastness. Are you steadfast, serious, devoted, dedicated, sober, sanctification? Holiness, purity. What kind of foundation are you laying? The foundation you lay today will determine your future. Be definite in your prayer. Be specific in your prayer. Make up your mind. Now I will work hard. And I work smart. And I will not choose partners that will ruin my life or destroy my life. A partner that we can pray together, we can read together, we can study together. I will not compromise my conviction with my brothers, with my sisters, with my friends, with my schoolmates. And when I cannot correct them by myself, I'll have to report them to those who are older than myself. Who can correct them, counsel them, and help them through to conversion? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for today. Thank you for this study where we've learned about foundation for a great future. We're asking, O oh Lord, that all that we have learned today will profit our lives in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, as many as have not given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be genuine repentance. They will confess their sins and turn away from them and be truly converted and saved in Jesus' name. Grant us your grace to begin to lay the right foundation, the foundation of salvation. The foundation of good schooling, 
and the foundation of separation, the foundation of service, the foundation of self-control, the foundation of, of steadfastness, and the foundation of sanctification. And we pray, Lord, as your grace and your spirit will help us to lay these foundations, the future will be great for every one of us in Jesus' name. We will climb the ladder of progress. We will climb the ladder of success. We will go up, we will not go down. And I pray, Lord, your hand will be upon us. Keep us healthy. Keep us whole. And we pray, Lord, in everything we do, we will prosper in Jesus' name. Evil eyes will not see us. Evil hands will not touch us. We will not befriend evil people. We will be people that are standing for righteousness. In the future, if Jesus tarries, the stories about us will be stories of success. Confirm it, O oh Lord. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless every one of you.